Hi there, it's Howie in the UK. I'm going to be posting this video response to Awoken Spirit, who um, put a video of an analysis of the God Delusion written by uh, Richard Dawkins. And uh, that uh, analysis was done by Alistair McGrath, who um, is also a chap at Oxford University in the Divinity Department, of course. McGrath, uh, it's the first time I ran across uh, th this fellow, and uh, I really found the man amazing, uh, that in, in an educated person uh, with a bit of a background in science, more than a bit of a background in science, you could have such blindingly inane uh, sets of beliefs uh, co-residing uh, within the same head uh, without a, a person being insane. Uh, but I guess that's what religion can do for you. If there was ever an example of muddled reasoning and lack of logic, uh, Alistair McGrath is that example. He combines that uh, amazing combination of abject pretended humility uh, with uh, obvious egotistical arrogance that is so common um, in mainstream committed religious person. What McGrath is going to be trying to do here in an interview he had with Richard Dawkins is explain uh, the existence of evil with what he feels is a very rational uh, analysis of the behavior of God, uh, the all-powerful, all-good God that allows evil to occur. And if you can stay religious, and believe in reason and watch McGrath uh, be decimated by Richard Dawkins, uh, there's definitely no hope for you. So I uh, hope you enjoy uh, the following clip. When you read of tens of thousands of people being killed, drowned or blown away, whatever it is, and then you read that one child was saved and the parents are thank God for saving this one child. Doesn't the irony of it strike you? I mean, that, that, that God could have saved all those 10,000 people. Why would he save this, this one child? I mean, I, I, I would hope that he would say he didn't save the one child. The one child was just lucky. You, as a detached scholar and theologian, would you want to say God saved that one child? I'd want to say that God saved that one child. I'd also want to say that the parents in question were right to give thanks for that. But I, I would therefore not want to say, I think, that God was in some way responsible for what happened elsewhere. I'd want to say that rather the limitations of the way the world is lead us to the point where this happened in the first place. In other words, that uh, you know, the, the key question is, could a world be made in which these volcanoes do not erupt, in which there is no shifting of plates, where there are no tidal waves? And that, I think, is not a question about God. I think it's a question about the way things are. I can't help feeling you're painting yourself into a rather awkward corner here, because um, on the one hand, you're, you're, you're saying, well, these are plate tectonic events, and could one imagine a world that didn't have um, plates drifting around and therefore the occasional earthquake and tsunami, and perhaps you can't. But if God has the power to, I mean, I thought to be consistent, you would say, no, the plate tectonics is part of God's creation. God is a, is a, um, a, a creator of a world, a universe in which plate tectonics is part of it. And therefore, he can't change that and wouldn't wish to. It would be almost undignified. It would almost be a kind of blasphemy to go in there and start messing around with the, this perfect creation which he's, which he's made. But then you suddenly say, well, he saved the one child. I mean, that seems to me to be completely to undermine the uh, rather loftily but consistently um, reasonable position that, you, that you've come to about the way the world is, is made. You're suddenly backtracking and saying, oh, but he can just reach out and pick out one child and, 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 and save that, that one child. How do you reconcile that? In the case of a situation where many thousands may have died, for example, as in the recent earthquake, yet one survives. Obviously, there is this very important question, did God choose to save that one? If so, what was wrong with all the others?
And I think that the natural Christian instinct, which I believe to be correct here, is indeed to speak of God saving that child. Not because God wanted any others to perish, but because God, as it were, chose to save that one. And I think that the whole language here, which we find, for example, in Augustine, is that of God wanting to do something in the midst of a world which is not perfect. And again, the Christian vision of the world is that this is not the way God wants the world to be. It's the idea of an imperfect, a fallen world, a world of suffering, where things happen which God does not want to happen. And the key point, again, I want to stress is that I do not believe it represents any failure on God's part, that this is a world of suffering, a world of death, a world where things happen which we know God would not want to happen. I feel you're being extraordinarily inconsistent in, on the one hand, saying the world is the world, it runs the way it is because God made it that way and he can't just interfere capriciously and arbitrarily. But on the other hand, you are allowing him to interfere capriciously and arbitrarily. And in what it looks like to me is that the world is precisely the way it would look if there were no guiding spirit, no God, nothing controlling it. Bad things happen, good things happen, and there's nothing we, we can say to explain why bad luck happens to some people rather than others. It just happens that way. Uh, that's the way the world looks like to me. And I I understand the consolation point you're making. Of course people can get consolation from it. What I don't understand is how a sophisticated, rational thinking man like you can buy that stuff. In his diatribe against the God delusion, the only main point that McGrath makes is that he studied science once and he ended up eventually as a religious person. That's all that we really find in, in the arguments over 30 minutes of uh, video. Uh, it's an incredibly pompous and arrogant kind of defensive argument as to say that his stance uh, with regard to science and religion uh, has got to be taken on face value as being correct. Uh, he's a very arrogant, pompous sort of a chap. And you can see in the debate between McGrath and Dawkins just how disconnected his reasoning is, if there is any reasoning, with his faith. He takes many points uh, on, on faith, but he won't admit it. And these premises are totally unsubstantiated and in conflict with one another. Uh, McGrath should have um, stuck to the most sound basis to be religious, which is basically um, an act of faith. Uh, uh, Tertullian essentially said it um, in about the second century when he said, I believe because it is absurd. Uh, credo quia absurdum. And he essentially said that you cannot deal with religion on a rational basis. And we can all see that in how McGrath fails to even respond effectively to Dawkins' unremitting logic. The sad thing, unfortunately, is to see the arrogance in which, which this um, McGrath actually uh, addresses his sort of debate. Uh, that doesn't sort of reflect very well on religion either. So my suggestion to my religious friends, don't try to be logical. If you want to believe, uh, be like uh, Tutorian and just stick away from uh, rationality. Avoid logic. Uh, there's no hope for you and you just end up being a pompous fool just like McGrath.